Today we read about a Syrophoenician woman. We know a few key facts about this woman from our reading today. As a Gentile, she was held in suspicion and disdain by the Hebrew community, seen as unclean and unwelcome. As a woman, she had little or maybe even no social standing in her community. And politically, she lived under the heavy hand of Roman oppression. For this Syrophoenician woman, life was hard. And sometimes, frankly, that's our story. For some of us, obstacles and challenges seem never ending. For others of us, our lives may have more ups than downs. But for me, for you, for all of us, there will come a moment in our lives when everything is turned upside down, when our carefully laid plans are shattered, when everything we've been working towards falls apart. That was Bethany Hamilton's story. Growing up on the beautiful shores of Hawaii, Bethany loved to surf. By the time she was eight years old, she was competing in surfing contests, dreaming of being a professional surfer, dreaming of riding the biggest wave, of having one of the biggest names in her sport. Bethany's family regularly went to church, and her faith played a key role in her life. And Bethany believed that God had given her this love of surfing. On October 31st, 2003, the golden sun rose over the Hawaii coast, revealing rolling waves, the sort, of, the sort of scene that surfers dream of. Bethany, just 13 years old at the time, was doing what she loved most. She was at the beach surfing with her friends. Bethany lay on her surfboard with her left arm dangling in the water as she waited for the next wave. And then, in an instant, her life changed forever. A 14-foot tiger shark surged up from beneath the water and clamped down on Bethany's left arm. Her arm was immediately completely severed below the shoulder. For the Syrophoenician woman, we don't know the moment when everything changed. What we do know is this Syrophoenician woman, her beloved daughter, became possessed by what the Bible calls an unclean spirit. We don't know exactly what the problem was. If she was deathly ill, or if she was injured, or if she faced some sort of psychological or mental illness, all we're told is that this unclean spirit took over this little girl's life. And for this mother, this Syrophoenician woman, who was already burdened by so much, life became immeasurably worse. And I imagine she must have felt tempted to think that she was completely powerless. You see, the question for the Syrophoenician woman and the question for Bethany Hamilton, and the question for each of us is where will we turn when things go wrong? Where will we look for support? Where will we look for strength? Where will we look for sustenance? When everything seems to be falling apart, where will we look if we want our lives to change for the better? And I'm sure you know what I'm about to say. In fact, you could probably say the answer with me. After all, we're in a church. The answer is Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit like the Sunday school teacher who was with her preschool class, and she asked the children, what do you call that thing that, that climbs up trees and, gather, and collects nuts for the winter and has a furry tail, and sometimes it scurries across power lines? And there was a long pause, and then a little boy raised his hand, and he said, it sounds like you're describing a squirrel. But since this is Sunday school, Jesus? Yeah. 
we can laugh, but there really is truth there. Where do we look for strength? Who do we turn to for comfort and solace and purpose and direction? Yes, the answer is absolutely Jesus, but the answer is also more complex, more nuanced than that. You see, Bethany Hamilton, the Syrophoenician woman, they both did indeed turn to Jesus, but that alone didn't instantly fix their problems. And my guess is that in many of our lives, in your life or in mine, there are times when things go wrong and we know we should look to Jesus, and we do, but then what next, we wonder. You see, this Syrophoenician woman could have simply hoped that her daughter would get better or that a miracle would take place, but that wasn't enough. She had to do something. She heard about where Jesus was and who Jesus was, and she decided to go see him. And this was not just a simple journey for her. It wasn't her running down the, to Walgreens to get some sort of medicine for her daughter's tummy ache. As a Gentile woman approaching a Jewish rabbi or teacher, she was crossing significant cultural and political and social boundaries. But her love for her daughter drove her to take this risk. She took action. She made her way to Jesus and she begged him for help. And then we read Jesus' somewhat vexing reply. Jesus said, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. What does that mean? Or why did Jesus respond that way? Was Jesus testing this woman's faith? Or was Jesus trying to teach his onlooking disciples something about the power of persistence? Or was Jesus trying to force his disciples to see and acknowledge that his mission of love and mercy and grace extended not only to the Hebrew people, but to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth? We don't know exactly why Jesus responded this way, but for whatever reason, Jesus' initial answer to this Syrophoenician woman seemed to be no. But notice the response. The Syrophoenician woman didn't give up. She didn't hang her head and walk away defeated. Instead, she took action once again. She got in Jesus' face. She argued with Jesus. She turned Jesus' own words around on him and said, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She engaged with Jesus, and in doing so, she revealed a faith that was not only deep, but resilient and active. Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Faith, if it has no works, is dead. When Bethany Hamilton came home from the hospital, her left arm amputated, everyday tasks that had once been simple and mundane were now monumental challenges. And the ocean, once a place of solace and joy for her, now carried this trauma of this near-death experience. Her dreams for a surfing career seemingly vanished. Yet in the midst of these trials, Bethany's faith didn't evaporate, instead it deepened. Her guiding light became a verse from Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not, not, Christ can do all things for me. Not I'm totally passive in this, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It wasn't just a verse she repeated, it became a way of living for her. Rather than seeing this shark attack as the end of her dream, Bethany saw it as a challenge to grow in her strength 
and to grow in her reliance and her trust that God was with her. Just one month after this shark attack, Bethany decided to get back on her surfboard. The physical challenges were immense with one arm paddling through the surf, maintaining her balance, navigating the waves. But Bethany was unwilling to just wait and hope that things would get better. Bethany believed that God had given her a love of surfing and she wasn't going to let anything, not even the loss of her arm, take that away from her. For Bethany, it was not just about reclaiming a hobby. It was about reclaiming her life, a purpose. Faith, you see, moves us to pray. And that, fa and that same faith should also move us to act. After the Syrophoenician woman boldly engaged Jesus, after she took action, refusing to give up, something remarkable happened. Jesus responded to her saying, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. This woman had no guarantee beyond what Jesus said, but she acted in faith based on his words. And when she arrived home, she found her daughter and the demon indeed was gone. The unclean spirit had left. And in that moment, the Syrophoenician woman's faith was rewarded, not just because she believed, but also because she took action. Just over a year after the shark attack, Bethany Hamilton won her first national surfing title, a testament not only to her physical resilience, but also a testament to the power of her faith when put into action. You see, faith is not just about believing. It's also about doing. With faith and also with action, we can rise above whatever unclean spirits, whatever they are, God has placed in our lives, achieving the dreams and the visions that God has given to us and to our families and our communities. You see, the question for you and frankly, the question for me at times also is when things go terribly wrong in our lives, when we find ourselves in the middle of suffering or uncertainty or pain or fear, will we simply hope that things will get better? Or will we take action? Will we take proactive steps to move forward? Will we take proactive steps to improve our lives and improve the world around us. In today's epistle from James, we read that faith without works is dead. Our faith compels us to engage with the world around us, to bring God's love and God's justice to life through our actions. We're commanded to live out our faith each and every day taking action to bring about the changes we pray for. If, for example, we want the youngest children among us to know that we are loved, we could found a preschool. That's exactly what the cathedral did 20 years ago, what we're celebrating on this day. Or if, for example, we want our relationships to be better, we shouldn't just hope they improve, we must invest in those relationships. Invest in communicating clearly, spending quality time with those we love, showing love in meaningful ways. Prayer is powerful, but it's meant to be linked to actions. Or, for example, it's not simply enough to pray for professional success. We must also take practical steps, whether that means furthering our education or getting certifications or finding mentors. God gives us the tools but you and I must learn to pick them up and use them. You see, faith is not just a passive wanting. Instead, faith is an active partnership with God. So when we reflect on our faith, let us remember that it must be lived out through all of our works each day. When we pray for something, let our prayers lead us to take action. 
And when we want to see God do something in the world, let us remember that you and I are the hands and feet of God in the world, and through us, God's work can be done. Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. I pray that you and I have an active and a vibrant and a living faith. Amen.